Hello there geographers and welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're going into unit two, topic three, and this is going to be a cool video. We're going to be talking about population composition, but more importantly, we get to go into population pyramids. And if you haven't seen these before yet, get ready because these things can give us so much insight into what's going on in a society. And if you're finding value in this video and some of the other topic videos, don't forget to subscribe. Remember, it's free, it helps support the channel, and allows me to make more videos. Population pyramids show us a breakdown of society, sex, and age at a given time. And we can use these pyramids to gain better insight into the different demographic breakdowns of society. And we can use it too at a variety of scales, from our local to our regional, national, and even global. Now before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's just actually look at how do we read these pyramids. Now right off the bat, you can see when looking at these pyramids that it's broken down into age ranges. That's our y-axis. These are also known as cohorts. We're looking at the ages of people in society. Now we can also see too that the x-axis on the other hand is showing our population. Most of the time this is done in numbers or sometimes a percent. The other thing you'd probably notice is that our population pyramid has two categories. We have men and women. Here what we're looking at is the sex breakdown of society. And for the most part, population pyramids will use the standard blue and pink to be able to identify the two sides. Now I do need to highlight this is a snapshot in time. So it's really important we look at the date whenever looking at a population pyramid. We're only recording what the current population breakdown is at that moment. Now at first, sometimes students get confused by looking at these pyramids. We're looking at a lot of information here and we're trying to take it in all at once. What I want you to do whenever you look at these right away, start looking for some themes. For example, we could actually break this y-axis down into different cohorts, our age ranges. We can see there's different categories. We could look at the bottom of our population pyramid and see our pre-reproductive years. This would be the range 0 to 14. Or we could start to move up from there and look at our reproductive years, the 15 to 44 year olds or the post-reproductive years, which would be anyone that is 45 and up. By understanding those different categories, we could actually gain insight right away. I could see that if I have the majority of my population in the pre-reproductive years or reproductive years, well, we're probably gonna be growing a lot faster as a population compared to a society that has the majority of their population in the post-reproductive years. Just by understanding the ranges, we can see what's gonna happen to the future of this society. Another aspect of society that we could see from these population pyramids would be a society's dependency ratio. This ratio is really important for us to be able to understand. To find it, what we would do is take the amount of people who are in that 0 to 14 range, the pre-reproductive and also pre-working, and add then people who are 65 and up, the people who have retired from society. Once we have that number, we would just divide by the working population and times by 100. Now the math isn't too bad, but you don't have to worry that as much about calculating as much as you have to worry about understanding what it means. If that number is really high, that means our dependency ratio is high, and that means society is going to have more burdens on it. It's going to have to worry about being able to cover all the costs for people who are retired and all of the children. We have less people working, but more people that are out of the economy, and so we'll have to possibly raise taxes or find other ways to be able to afford things like child care, social security, retirement plans, all these different aspects that need to be taken care of. But on the other hand though, if that dependency ratio is really low, that puts less burden on the working population to be able to support those in society who are not working. Since we're on the topic of ratios, another ratio you're going to hear throughout this course is the sex ratio. This is looking at the ratio of men to women. And what we would do to find this is we'd take the amount of live male births and we would divide it then by the amount of live by female births. Then we would times by 100. If our number's over 100, that means more men are being born than women. And if it's under 100, that means more women are being born than men. If it's right at 100, that means it's perfectly even. Now we could look at two different sex ratios. We could look at the birth ratio, but we could also look at just total population. An interesting thing that happens oftentimes is that over time, we actually start to see women outnumber the men. And that's because of actually men dying sooner than women. On the other hand though, it depends what country you're in. If there's certain cultural aspects or also maybe political aspects that are limiting births or are changing how we view the genders, that could skew a sex ratio as well. So that's something to look at when looking at population pyramids and just population data in general. If we look at these pyramids even further, we can gain even more insight. For example, if I see a pyramid with a really big base, that's going to indicate to me that that population 
population is probably booming, that we're going to see a lot of growth in the coming years. On the other hand, if I start to see a population pyramid that's more filled out, that shows that the population growth rate has probably stabilized more. We're now starting to see it evenly distributed and we're going to see a slower growth. Or if I see a population pyramid with a massive top, that probably means that the majority of the population is older and we're going to start to see a decrease in our population. Not even growth anymore, they're probably declining. And we're going to connect back to this when we go into the demographic transition model. These pyramids can also show us a glimpse into the past of a society. For example, when looking at Russia's population pyramid from 2018, we can see that actually if we focus on the 70 and up group, that we can actually see a lot less men than women. This shows some of the scars of past wars where men were drafted and women were not. Now I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, what's the point of this? I mean, that's great we can see into the past, future, and current day, but why does this really matter? And to illustrate why it does matter, let's change our scale. Let's first keep looking at population pyramid at the country level. When we're looking at it at the country level, well, politicians can use this data to better predict are we going to need to have more agriculture? Are we going to get more food? Or are we going to have to rely on imports? If I see that really big base, I know that we have a lot of people being born. Our population's growing. I need to make sure that those people then have enough food and water and places to live. I also need to make sure that in the future they can have jobs. If I have massive unemployment, I'm going to run into some issues here. If we change our scale now and we actually look at one of the 50 states within the United States and switch our scale to a regional scale, we can actually gain a different level of insight. Here, states are going to be worried about their population numbers. If their population starts to decrease, if we don't have a large base at the bottom and we start to see a more aging population within a state, they might get less federal funding. They might lose electoral votes. After the census is conducted every 10 years, they recount and redistribute the votes, and it's all based on population. Also, the state might have to focus their priorities on different services. If they know that the majority of people in their region, their state, are elderly, they need to be able to provide more health care, more retirement homes. And if we change our scale to the local scale, cities here could actually use demographic data to better understand exactly who lives in their city. What services do they need? What public projects can they fund? If we start to see a large population there, well, there's more taxes. On the other hand, two businesses would use this information to see, okay, what is the age breakdown of people in this area? What businesses should we open up and which ones wouldn't work for that particular population? For example, an area that has a lot of people in the working class and a lot of people who are also just graduating college will probably have a more active and vibrant downtown community compared to a population that has a lot of children, which will probably have more schools and parks that need to be built. So depending on what's going on with the data, we can actually see cities change their entire landscape. And as they grow and shrink over time, it's going to be important that they track the data. If they don't follow what's going on with their population, well, they might experience things like brain drain, where people start to leave because the needs of the citizens aren't being met. Now, we've only just started to scratch the surface with these pyramids. Next time when we go into 2.4, we're gonna talk about different population dynamics, and we're gonna delve deeper into demographic data. We're gonna look at how different political, social, cultural, and environmental factors can shape these pyramids and can change the outcome of a society. Now, before you go and check out the next video, don't forget to answer the review questions on the screen. Remember, you can check your answers in the comments below. Also, if you're struggling with AP Human Geography, don't forget to check out that ultimate review packet. I have practice quizzes in there, study guides, answer keys, summary videos, practice tests. If you're struggling in your class, it is a great resource to help you do better. Not only to get an A in the class, but also a five on that exam. All right, that's all we got for today, geographers. I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, I'll see you online.